What do you think of when you think of a ladybug, also known as a lady beetle? Do you think of a small round beetle that has red wing covers covered in black spots, much like the image you see on the screen? So this is actually an Asian ladybug, which is a non-native species. And in Vermont, we have a number of different lady beetles that have a wide variety of appearances, as you can see on the screen. And they also come in many different shapes. As you can see, some are more oblong, some are a lot rounder and kind of have this upturned edge on their electra or wing covers. And we also have some, if you find little um, circular dots like this on leaves, these are ladybug eggs. And also, you know, they could be eggs of other insects as well. My personal identification of ladybug eggs is not the greatest, but this is an example of what ladybug eggs look like. You can also find them in larval form. They look like little spiky worms or like small alligators. Also, just to pause briefly, I'm getting a little bit of feedback on my end. Um, so if anyone who is unmuted currently could mute themselves, that would be awesome. So you can see here, the larvae are rather long and have six legs like the ladybug when it's older. And then you can also find them in pupil form. Like their appearances, ladybugs are found in a wide variety of habitats across North America. They can be found in basically every terrestrial ecosystem from forests to farmlands and grasslands, along with marshes and up at the top of mountains. Our native lady beetle species have evolved with these ecosystems and have evolved to hunt small, soft-bodied insects, such as aphids, mealybugs, and scale insects. Without our lady beetle species, these small, soft-bodied insects, which feed directly on plants, may become so numerous that they could actually begin to damage the plants that they feed on. Across North America, we have at least 475 different species of lady beetle, which is quite incredible. Additionally, some species of lady beetle, our native lady beetles, have adapted to hunt introduced scale insects, aphids, and mealybugs, such as the twice-stabbed lady beetle and the scale component of beech bark disease. Additionally, um, lady beetles are a very common and recognizable invertebrate group, which are very sensitive to environmental conditions. So they have actually been proposed as an indicator species group. <clears throat> Across North America, lady beetles have actually, our native lady beetles have actually been in decline. These declines have been thought to be caused by a number of different factors, including the introduction of non-native lady beetles or invasive lady beetles, as seen from the Asian lady beetle that I showed on the first slide. And this is thought to be an issue because non-native lady beetles um, typically grow faster than native lady beetles. Um, have a tendency to eat native lady beetle larvae and can outcompete our native lady beetles for habitats and for food. Additionally, with these non-native lady beetles come some introduced diseases, which may be um, negatively impacting our native lady beetle species more than they impact the introduced lady beetle species that have evolved with these diseases. Finally, land use change and pesticide use are also thought to be causes of these native lady beetle declines, as many lady beetle species utilize farm habitat to eat the aphids there, and as many small farms have gone out of business and urbanization has increased, um, these lady beetles have less land that they can use. 
So how are our native lady beetles doing in Vermont? Lady beetles were actually not on the VAL or Vermont Atlas of Life, which is the subgroup within the Vermont Center for Eco Studies radar until 2018. In 2018, we were sent this checklist, which you can see on the screen. It was a survey of lady beetles that was completed in 1976. We digitized this, which means that we took the data from this record and uploaded it to an online database, which has a bunch of different records from different researchers, from iNaturalist, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and from some other areas as well. And basically through digitizing this, we realized that 13 of our native lady beetle species had not been seen in over 40 years. This document and this finding really spurred questions about what Vermont's current native lady beetle fauna is, because we realized while digitizing this that we didn't really have very many records after this survey was completed. As a result, we decided to collect as much data as we could to kind of see if we could fill in some of these gaps. Therefore, we digitized other records, such as Vermont Lady Beetle records from the Cornell University's Lost Ladybug Project. And we also digitized Lady Beetle collections, which are when you have Lady Beetles that a researcher or naturalist or anyone has collected over time and pinned and put in a bug box. And we digitized collections from the University of Vermont, Middlebury, Vermont Forest Parks and Recreation. And we also recently just digitized the collection from Fairbanks Museum, which we are still working on cleaning and getting on our online database. Additionally, we collected research grade observations from iNaturalist and at that point came to the end of data that we knew about. So from these digitizations, we found that there are 35 native and seven introduced species of lady beetle, totaling 42 species of lady beetle in Vermont. And as I said, 13 of these species had been missing for over 40 years as of 2019. Other species seem to be following those national trends of decline. And to show you a visual representation of what our data looks like at this point, you can see here on the screen, this is where that 1976 survey was completed. And one thing to note is this number is lower than the 42 total species because a lot of our introduced species such as the Asian lady beetle, the variegated lady beetle, seven spotted and 14 spotted lady beetle were all established after 1980. And while we can't say definitively because we lack a lot of data, it is definitely suspicious that these introduced species which have been suggested to be a cause of native, native lady beetle decline were introduced around the same time that we have a very large dip in the number of species being observed. So these apparent declines and missing species leads us to the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas. Basically, we want to understand what lady beetles still exist in Vermont and how they are doing. This will allow us to determine what conservation measures may need to be taken to address any declines and will also give us information on are these missing species extirpated or extinct in the state of Vermont or do they still exist in low numbers. This will also allow us to kind of figure out whether we may need to introduce or reintroduce native lady beetles potentially try to combat invasive lady beetles or take other steps to really help support these important beetle species. So our Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas is a statewide atlas looking for lady beetles across all different ecosystem types and hopefully 
taking surveys across as much of the state of Vermont as possible. To do this, we are calling on community scientists, such as hopefully yourselves, to help us with these surveys. Basically what a community science framework means is that we encourage naturalists to collect data with us and help us with identifications. And the reason why we are using this framework is because it's very powerful. So um, engaging with community volunteers has multiple benefits, including um, increasing awareness for conservation, reducing the costs associated with research, and increasing the chances of finding beetles. Also, I'm going to pause briefly to try and get my bird to quiet down a little bit. Okay, hopefully there will be less background noise on my end now. <clears throat> so as you can see here, our Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas piloted in 2020, and there was a huge spike in the number of lady beetle records that we had between 2019 and 2020. So this here is the number of lady beetle records that we have and that exist over time. And you can see that prior to starting to encourage community naturalists to report sightings of different organisms on iNaturalist, which is the Vermont Atlas of Life creation on iNaturalist, overall records of lady beetles were extremely low. You can see there was that spike around the time that that 1976 survey was completed. But other than that, we have, for the most part, under 100 records until we have this extreme jump in records, which has been really exciting. Um, we are using a community science framework that has been used in both other Vermont Atlas of Life projects and has also been used in other ladybug projects. So for example, the Cornell Lost Ladybug Project um, encouraged community volunteers to help them look for lady beetles and community volunteers found two spotted and nine spotted lady beetle populations in the state of New York where they were previously thought to be extinct. <clears throat> and now I'm going to talk about how we collect our community volunteer contributions, which is using this platform called iNaturalist. And I hope that if any of you want to help us look for ladybugs, you will sign up for iNaturalist and assist us in this way. So basically, iNaturalist is a free platform, entirely free, that helps to connect people with science and community naturalists with each other. And basically, iNaturalist assists with identifications of the wild organisms you are interacting with, both through artificial intelligence within iNaturalist suggesting identification and through having other community naturalists that are using iNaturalist assist with identifications. iNaturalist is also a really powerful platform for researchers to use because basically the unit of iNaturalist is called an observation, which is one interaction or series of photos of one organism at one time. So say you photograph a tree in your backyard and upload those photos. You can have multiple photos of that tree, but that would all be within one observation because it's that one individual at that one time. And basically, once you have uploaded that, other community members will either confirm your identification or will suggest a different identification if you either didn't know what the species was or it misidentified it. And this way, after a few people have confirmed or suggested a new identification and then agreed on that, your observation becomes research grade, which basically means that it is confirmed or highly likely that that species is now correctly identified. 
And that observation can get pulled into other databases that are then used by researchers. So I'm going to do a new screen share and show you some of the um, some of the cool aspects of iNaturalist. So within iNaturalist, you have this explore tab, which allows you to search for any group of species within any location across the world. And you can see right now, because I have Vermont as my preset geographic location, only the observations within the state of Vermont are coming up. And if I zoom in further, you can see all of these little teardrop shapes, each of which represents one person's observation of one species. And then when you click on this observation, you get taken to a page that has a lot more information about who observed this organism and where they observed it. So you can see this is the person that uploaded this photo. You can see up here it says research grade, meaning that it has been confirmed that this is a correct identification by more than one person. You can see on the map where this observation was taken. And also it's important to note if you say have observed something in your backyard, but you don't want your um, house listed on iNaturalist, you can do something called obscuring your location. And basically what iNaturalist will do then is just pick a random location that's within a certain distance of where you actually observe the organism and drop a pin there so people don't know where it was actually observed. And you can see as you scroll down, you have the people who identified this here. I have the ability to agree with this identification or leave a comment or suggest a new identification if I believe that this grasshopper was misidentified. I'm also able to annotate this identification, which means that um, you just add more information to the observation. And from this photo, I can tell that this grasshopper was alive. So I'm able to just select alive. And this just allows anyone who wants to search for two striped grasshoppers that are living versus dead to easily filter their searches. And another really impressive aspect of iNaturalist is if you either search for a species or taxonomic group, or you simply click on the species page that you are on for this one observation, you get taken to the overall species page. And you can see here that you have a bunch of different information about the two-striped grasshopper. So to begin, you're able to view an interactive map as to where these grasshoppers have been observed across the whole world. And again, you're able to click on any of these observations. You have an about page for the species or if you were to search just grasshoppers in general, the taxonomic group. And this about page um, sometimes has a lot of information, sometimes has a little bit of information because it just links to Wikipedia. So there will be as much, or as much information in here as exists in Wikipedia. You also have some tabs on the side where you can find out more information about the species. You also have access to a taxonomic tree, the conservation status, if there is one, and this is my favorite part of iNaturalist. There's a similar similar species tab. So if you, oops, if you are unsure of identifications, you can look at other species that are commonly misidentified as two striped grasshoppers and maybe be able to better narrow down what you have actually observed. 
Additionally, you have some information up here that shows seasonality, history of since iNaturalist was created. This is like number of observations over time, a breakdown of life stages. So you can see you have adult, nymph, which is like the larva stage and no annotation. And then you also have male versus female. And all of this information down here from the map to all oh, the about information remains the same as does the taxonomic tree, but status, similar species, and these graphs here can all be adjusted by a certain location. So I could type in Vermont, for example, and you can see that there has been a shift in the graph here for all of these tabs because these now reflect only observations that were made in Vermont, as now you can see there are only two other species that have been misidentified as um, these two striped grasshoppers in the state of Vermont. Another thing that I very briefly wanted to highlight in iNaturalist is the Identify tab. So you again, can filter by species or taxonomic group by location and both the explore tab and the identify tab have this more filter section where you're able to further filter the observations that you are viewing. So you can either click on a category like birds if you don't want to type in birds as your group up here. Um, you can also search for specific observations by people or by projects, which is another aspect of iNaturalist. And then you can see here, there's that annotation feature. And basically what you can do in Identify is you can click on any observation that is here. And you can see a bunch of information about this observation along with photos. If there were more photos, I could click through the photos. And you can then either agree with the identification that's here, or you can click add ID if this person misidentified this moth. And I must admit my moth identification skills are not um, super high and I'm not sure if they've correctly identified this. So I'm not going to add an identification or agree. So this tab here is how people can get more observations to be research grade and iNaturalist and help each other learn. So the final thing I want to show you in iNaturalist is the upload tab. And this is how you can add photos directly to iNaturalist. And basically what you do is you just select choose photos and go to your um, pictures location on your computer. And then you can select a number of photos at once by single clicking on the first one you wish to upload, holding shift down on your keyboard, and then clicking the last photo you wish to upload, and then selecting open. Now you can see all of these photos are populated. I call these each one of these tabs here a plate. So each photo is on a single plate. However, as I said before, if you have multiple photos of the same individual, you want them to be in one observation. So what I can do, because these are all the same 14 spotted lady beetle, I can hold shift down on my keyboard again and click, single click on the white part of each of these plates. And then at the top, click combine. And now you can see I have all four photos in one place of this lady beetle. Another thing that's really nice is you can mass edit your observations. So say I would grouped all of my individuals together into their various observations, and I only want to group edit the first four. I can then hold down shift again on my keyboard and select those observations. And then you can see over here, I can edit multiple species, edit the date for all of these at once, and edit the location for all of these at once. I could also do that for all of these by clicking select all. 
and then do the same information. So this is really convenient because I did actually find all of these lady beetles in the same field on the same date. So I could just do edit multiple dates and edit location for all of these. And then that would save me a lot of time. You can see right here, this is what I was talking about with geo privacy. You're able to obscure or make entirely private your location. And then you have the ability to add more information to all of these observations or a single one of these observations down here. All right. I am going to jump back into my presentation now. But if anyone has any iNaturalist specific questions, definitely feel free to pop those in the chat or unmute yourself and ask them. All right. So another thing I wanted to note with iNaturalist is the fact that you are able to use a mobile app version of iNaturalist to more easily upload your observations. And you can see here, you have that same explore tab that you do in the online version of iNaturalist. And you can click all of these teardrops to find out more information about what was seen here. And you also have a bunch of other options in the mobile app. You can look through your activity. Um, you can see your specific observations. And your activity is just like either you have identified other people's observations or um, other people have added identifications to your observations. And then you also have the ability to make observations in the mobile app by clicking the camera icon here. And then you can see that you have um, you have the option to either take a photo or upload multiple photos from your camera roll, which this one is the one that I recommend because iNaturalist only allows you to take one photo at a time, which if you're say photographing an insect could mean that the insect leaves before you're able to capture a good photo of it. So I recommend just taking photos on your phone and then adding to iNaturalist using this camera roll. Then you can see here you have the photos that you've selected and you can then identify what you've seen. These are tracks from a red squirrel. You can add notes, again, edit any information about the location or date or geo privacy here. And then you just click save and it uploads to your iNaturalist account. Additionally, if you either have kids or there are kids that are watching right now, if you want to learn more about everything that is outside, also I personally use Seek, so it's for adults as well, um, but you, don't, you either don't want to quite dive into having an iNaturalist account or you just want an easy identification tool when you're outside, you can use this app called Seek. And it's sort of like, uh, it's been described as sort of like a nature version of Pokemon Go or like the Shazam, which is a music identification app of nature. And so basically what you can do is go outside and just point your phone and take some photos of whatever organism, so say a flower that you want to identify, and then Seek will tell you what it is. And if it's not entirely certain as to what the organism is, it'll just give you like a genus or a family. So it'll say, instead of saying silver maple, it might say, um, we're sure this is a maple, but we're not certain what species it is. But from there, you can either then use iNaturalist or another guide to help you figure out exactly what the species is. The final thing that's really nice about Seek is you have this thing called challenges and you can basically turn learning how to identify different organisms into a game. 
So on this next slide, I'm going to connect iNaturalist back to the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas. And if you'll turn your attention to the right hand side of the slide, you can see these red dots moving across the map of Vermont. Those represented the increase in research grade iNaturalist observations of lady beetles in the state of Vermont over the course of iNaturalist history. And after piloting our Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas, which we have a project for on iNaturalist, last year alone, which was our pilot year of the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas, we saw an increase in 234 iNaturalist users contributing Lady Beetle data to iNaturalist for the first time. Additionally, we doubled the number of research grade lady beetle observations on iNaturalist in one year, which was really exciting because once observations are research grade, we will use them in our lady beetle data research to determine where these species populations are. Because once they are research grade, we have that kind of um, extra layer of data quality where somebody else has agreed with the identification. So we are more certain that that photo, that lady beetle that was observed is correctly identified. Finally, we found one of our missing lady beetle species, which is really exciting. One thing I just wanted to point out is on iNaturalist, the difference in the number of research grade lady beetle observations between Vermont, which has the Vermont Atlas of Life doing the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas versus New Hampshire, which does not have an organization like the Vermont Atlas of Life that has people very actively surveying the state's flora and fauna, and also does not have a project looking for lady beetles. So you can see we have well over a thousand research grade lady beetle observations in Vermont versus in New Hampshire, there's only 416. You can also see here the number, like the difference in the number of people uploading these lady beetle observations and also the number of species. And one thing that's important to note here is the number of observations in both states that are of the Asian lady beetle, which is that, again, that um, lady beetle that I showed on the first slide, which is an invasive species. Um, they have become extremely populated across North America and also are very commonly associated with urban areas and with people because we are outside of their native range. And so if you find lady beetles in your house in the winter, they're probably Asian lady beetles since they like invading people's homes for the warmth during the winter. Additionally, our community naturalists have rediscovered four species that were lost for over 40 years, which included the four spotted spur leg lady beetle, which you can see right here on the slide, the convergent lady beetle, undulate single lady beetle, and the hieroglyphic lady beetle. And community naturalists have found three new species of lady beetle, which were never previously recorded in the state of Vermont before. These included the undoubtable lady beetle, mountain lady beetle, and the Octavia lady beetle, which you can also see right here on the slide. So, our next steps for this upcoming year are to increase participation in the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas. And this is how, if any of you are interested in contributing to our search and learning more about lady beetles, you can become involved. So you have a couple different options for involvement, which is really nice. The first is just incidental sightings, which is just you know, say you're out in your garden or you're walking your dog or just going about your daily life and you're like, oh, there's a lady beetle there. What you can do is simply snap a couple photos of it 
and upload those photos to iNaturalist. And then if you have any additional information that you can add to that photo, such as um, lady beetle was found on a maple tree or something like that, you can either add it in the notes or add it in, there's these things called observation fields in iNaturalist. Um, so we have a little bit more information about the beetle species, and that is greatly helpful in and of itself. You can also actively search for lady beetles, either visually just examining um, around this time of year, they're starting to come out of their overwinter hibernation, which is when they bury their, themselves in the leaf litter or under logs for the winter to survive and then emerge in the spring. So you can often find them on tree trunks or on bushes or on hardier vegetation that may exist as they kind of crawl up to warm up a little bit before dispersing. Um, and another way that you can actively search is by sweep netting, which is basically when you have an insect net and you walk around simply whacking vegetation, whether it's tree branches or grass in a meadow with the net. After you have walked and sweep netted for a little bit, you simply hold the net, kind of use your hand to create a closed off space at the bottom of the net to trap all of the insects in it. And then you can very slowly start to peel the net open and scoop any insects, any lady beetles or bees or other insects that you may be interested in into some small clear containers that you have to hold them while you're taking photos of them. And then you can simply release them. One thing to note with that is um, lady beetles in particular are very speedy. So it can be hard to photograph them well, even if they are in a container. So what you can do is simply bring like a lunchbox or small cooler with you with an ice pack and just pop them in the cooler for a couple minutes to cool them down. It won't hurt the lady beetles at all. It just slows them down a little bit so they're easier to photograph. The final way and most active way that you can contribute to lady beetle data is by adopting a survey block. So you can see on this map here, this is just a screen capture of our interactive map that we have on our website. You have these highlighted yellow and orange blocks. And basically what we did was we gridded out the state of Vermont using the US Geological Survey topographic maps, which cover the state of Vermont. We divided those into six roughly three by three mile blocks, which you can see on the screen, and then selected a representative number of those across the state of Vermont. And basically what you can do on our website is click on one of these highlighted blocks if it's near your house or somewhere you're willing to travel to. And then you can click adopt the block. And then basically all we ask you to do is go out and do at least one survey in each of the different habitats that may be found in your block over the course of the summer. So that would be in lady beetle terms, the summer would be from around this time of year through October, which is when they start aggregating and then going back in the leaf litter to survive the winter. And also one thing about the survey blocks is you are welcome to adopt them as a group. So then multiple people can go out at different times to survey, which lightens the load for everyone. And then one thing to note is if you adopt a block that goes across private property, just make sure that you get landowner permission before surveying on anyone's land. A few things with observation quality is to best identify these beetles from photos, it's helpful to get photos from a bunch of different angles. So you can see here, the lady beetle that I have on the screen is the 20 spotted lady beetle. And I have a photo of the underside of the beetle, the top of the beetle showing the um, wing covers, which are also called the Electra. And then I have one of the front of the beetle, so you can see the head and this middle section here is called the pronotum. So I have the pattern on both the head and the pronotum visible. And this is really important 
because there are some lady beetle species that are very difficult to differentiate unless you have photographs of all angles of the beetle. Additionally, some of these beetles are only um, able to be differentiated from similar species if you have a size reference. So it's helpful to either have a ruler when you're photographing these beetles to kind of give an idea of how long it is, or um, I have this beetle next to my fingertip, and also this is a cropped photo. So from my larger photo, what I could do is once I'm home, I could measure the part of my fingertip that the beetle went across as like a size reference, and then be like, oh, this beetle is roughly 2.3 millimeters in length or whatever the size may be. Finally, it is important to have accurate time, date, and location information. Even if you obscure your location, that's okay, um, as long as all of that data is accurate. Otherwise, your observation, even if your photos are beautiful, is not going to be able to become research grade, which means that we would not be able to use it in our atlas. To close, I wanted to talk about a few really incredible native lady beetle species that we have in the state of Vermont. The first of which is the eye spotted lady beetle. So these beetles are arboreal, which means that they live in trees. And specifically, they like living in conifer trees, such as your pines and your balsam firs, and sometimes spruces. They can grow to be between 7.3 and 10 millimeters in length, which is about the diameter of a dime, and are very important predators of the balsam twig aphid. A couple studies have found that the eye spotted lady beetle very actively hunts balsam twig aphids. They will actually bury their head into the buds of balsam firs or into kind of a bundle of new growth at the end of a twig to extract aphids. Um, one of these studies actually found that eye spotted lady beetles reduced overwintering balsam twig aphids by around 30%. Um, that's of the egg masses. They also were able to completely destroy, one individual could completely destroy aphid colonies once they located the aphid colony. So this just goes to show how important our native species are and how good they are at controlling small soft-bodied insect populations. We also have the twice-stabbed lady beetle, which I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. These guys really like scale insects and are a little bit smaller. They only grow to be about five millimeters in length. Since the introduction of beech bark disease, they have become very closely associated with heavily infested beech trees. So looking at the trunks of beech trees that have this sort of like white fluffy stuff on it is a really good way to find twice stabbed lady beetles. Additionally, these species or these beetles will go to trees that are the most heavily infested with scale insects, whether they're beech trees or conifer trees such as pine trees, and are very effective at reducing scale insect populations. Sadly, this does not help our beech trees as much as it could because beech bark disease is actually caused by both a scale insect and a fungus. So once the fungus is in the tree, it's really hard for the tree to make it. Another lady beetle species of note is our convergent lady beetle. These have been widely in decline across the United States. They have a very wide range. We have found only a couple of them in the last few years in Vermont. So this is a really good one to keep your eyes open for. They are a habitat generalist, meaning they can be found across a wide range of habitats, but have a high preference for agricultural crops meaning that they are a very effective biological control for aphids and other small insects in our food, which is amazing. They can actually be purchased for biological control because they are so good at controlling aphids and have a slight tolerance for pesticides. 
The final lady beetle I want to talk about today is the marsh lady beetle. We don't know very much about this species other than they are, as their name suggests, associated with wetlands, marshes, wet forests, and damper fields and meadows. They likely eat both aphids and scale insects in these environments, but this would be a really excellent lady beetle species to keep your eye out for just so we can get a better idea of the habitats that they are, like the exact habitats they're associated with in Vermont. So that concludes my presentation for today. Um, this link on the screen here, which I can pop into the chat in a moment, is the link to our Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas website. And I hope all of you are excited to help look for lady beetles and I am happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julia. I'm going to hop in with a couple questions that have come in during the presentation and, and before. So maybe you can help us with some of them. So the first one is from Diana in Peachum. And she asks, um, why do they like to be around people? One crawled around on my hand for 10 minutes yesterday. And I'm assuming that would have been one of the Asian lady beetles, do you think? Probably. Um, Diana, if you're here and you want to unmute at any point and give some more information on what the beetle looked like, definitely feel free. But especially this time of year, because it's still early in the year and they're just waking up for, from hibernation, it was probably attracted to your body heat would be my thought. Um, they also, lady beetles, for whatever reason, really like the color yellow um, and can be really attracted to brighter colors because they associate that with um, like flowers, which then hopefully there would be aphids there. Um, so it could be a combination of things like that. I, I'm not too positive as to why, but they are, you know, very friendly insects for the most part. Um, additionally, again, the Asian lady beetles are frequently found in urban areas and seem to be the beetles that we have the most of in terms of species in Vermont right now. So that also could contribute. Oh, you're muted, Allison. Maybe you covered this already, Julia, but are the Asian lady beetles um, beneficial or detrimental to, you know, since they're so widespread, are they good for our ecosystems? Or are they kind of not as great as the natives? So in my opinion, at least, they're not as great as the natives because they haven't been here as long and they don't really actively search for, um, native small soft-bodied insects the way our native species do. Um, even though they do eat more, like they, they do, they can outcompete some of our native lady beetle species for food if they're sharing the same habitat, um, but that's more when they're in agricultural habitats where it's very easy to access food than in more specialized environments where certain aphids or scale insects are only found in certain locations, that's when the native lady beetles really do a better job. It's like, especially since the Asian lady beetles very much eat native lady beetle larvae, they can really kind of take a toll on our native lady beetle populations, which overall is bad for our ecosystems. In general, anything that can reduce biodiversity is not a good thing. So we also had some great um, comments and suggestions from a couple of people on Facebook. Marcia uh, is a middle school teacher and she said, what if every middle school in Vermont were asked to participate at the same time? Each student to, could look in their own backyard X number of days and then report back. And then also um, Kat in Burlington suggested um, starting like neighborhood watches that where people could have designated areas where they areas of the city like the old North End where they uh, take surveys. So I think people are interested in trying to figure out the best way to structure kind of bigger efforts. Do you have any ideas on that, Julia? Yes, definitely. So we, um, we are planning on doing a kind of lady beetle bio blitz at some point 
once it's a little bit warmer out and they've been more active, just encouraging everywhere no, or everyone, no matter where they are, to get out and look for lady beetles. In terms of schools, that is a wonderful idea. And I'll actually um, put my email or my Gmail in the chat. There we go. So if anyone, you know, has either a school group or other groups that you'd be interested in coordinating a search with, definitely email me. I'd be super happy to help organize that. Um, but for the most part, we really want to encourage people to be adopting those priority blocks and surveying in those priority blocks. Or if a priority block is unaccessible, but you have, say, a really nice backyard or green space near your house, surveying regularly there is what we're really encouraging because we want to get a very complete survey of the lady beetles across the state of Vermont, um, kind of curated. So we have the best idea as to if any of these missing species still exist or not. But yeah, for the most part, just uploading things to iNaturalist and getting yourself on iNaturalist and then joining, I'll pop another link in the chat. We have the Vermont Atlas of Life on iNaturalist that we put out a lot of um, journal posts in. So that will um, update you as to when we have a lady beetle bio blitz or anything like that. Um, so getting on iNaturalist and then joining the Vermont Atlas of Life is a really great way to easily know when we're looking for lady beetles and when we're encouraging like a statewide search. Um, Julia, for people who are going out in their own backyards, where do you suggest, like if they can get a sweep net or um, if they don't have a sweep net, what, what are some habitats that you would suggest looking in? I'm just thinking about like mowed areas versus trees versus looking at, um, you know, shrubs or tree trunks. What are the best places for people to be, to be hunting in their, the habitats that are easiest for them to access? Definitely. So if you have an insect net or can make an insect net also on our Vermont Atlas or Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas website, which I popped in the chat, we do have in our participant manual ways that you can make your own sweep net. Um, but if you have a net, I recommend um, kind of whacking any vegetation that you have accessible. One thing to note is if you're hitting a shrub, you can whack it a little bit harder versus um, your annual plants you might want to be a little gentler with. Um, but if you don't have a net, that is totally fine. Just visually searching tree trunks, shrub trunks. And then if there are any plants in your yard that are, or in your garden that you've either noticed in the past attract a lot of aphids or are kind of juicier. So in my mind, that would be like clover versus grass. Um, just visually searching those is a really good way to find lady beetles. Um, another thing is if you notice a plant that's looking kind of sick, that would be a good plant to check out. Like if the leaves are a little bit discolored, it doesn't necessarily look dry. It just looks like it has some sort of pest problem. Its defenses will be lower. So it has a greater chance of being infected with aphids and other insects. So that's a really good way to kind of narrow your search. But as I said before, lady beetles are really found across every ecosystem. So we have lady beetles in trees and bushes, um, in kind of more grassy, meadowy habitats. So you really can't go wrong, like no matter where you're searching, it's just kind of searching everywhere. And then with trees, if there's like low hanging branches, looking along the vegetation as well is a really good way to find them. Um, another question that came in, Libby asked, are there Asian beetles or Asian beetles evolving in this environment? So they, they've definitely evolved a bit because they've been able to become established. Um, from the studies I've read, they are not on the same level as many of our native species that have really specialized with certain pests. Going back to that eye spotted lady beetle, the study actually directly compared eye spotted lady beetles to Asian lady beetles and found that Asian lady beetles would only 
eat balsam twig aphids if they happen to come across them. So that's called opportunistic foraging. Whereas the balsam, or mm, wow, <laughs> the eye spotted lady beetles very actively hunt the balsam twig aphids. So it's like they've evolved in the sense that they can survive in our ecosystems here, but they don't hunt, especially our native pests in the same way that our native lady beetle species do. Checking for other questions here. Um, what are some of the, the species that eat lady beetles? That is a really good question. So it kind of depends on the lady beetle species. They're actually not particularly palatable by a lot of organisms because many lady beetles um, will produce this like well, you've probably noticed this if you've ever had Asian lady beetles in your house, they have that very specific smell to them. A lot of lady beetles produce that kind of like chemical reaction if they're disturbed, which deters a lot of other um, organisms from eating them. That said, I'm sure uh, multiple different bird species probably eat primarily our native species. Um, and then there are bugs called like assassin bugs, which grab insects and then will um, kind of liquidize their insides and drink them. They're, it's insects are insects are interesting, um, but they probably eat lady beetles. That would be um, that would be a good thing for me to Google though because I haven't seen anything specific on that. Um, and Kat asks, are there specific outdoor plants that attract lady beetles? So definitely with some lady beetles, yes. For example, again, going back to the twice stabbed lady beetle, they're very closely associated with American beech trees. Um, in terms of gardens, it's, it's less plant specific and more whichever plant species have the highest aphid loads. Um, so in terms of having your garden attract lady beetles, that's not something that you necessarily want because that probably means that your garden isn't doing too well. Um, and actually lady beetles are very, very mobile. Some actually migrate between their wintering grounds and where they spend the summer. So in terms of having a garden or house structure that attracts them, you want a very wide diversity of different plants and structures. So then you have like bushes where your more arboreal species will be attracted to, and then just different vegetation structures in your garden will attract more. But on the larger scale, it actually is more important how your landscape around your house looks than your specific garden. Because if you have really healthy ecosystems around your house, then there will just be more lady beetles in general. Um, and then kind of conversely, we don't have any like super, super urban areas in Vermont. But if you were in like New York City, say, in an area that doesn't have a lot of green space, but had a really beautiful garden, then you would probably have a lot of lady beetles just simply because they had nowhere else to go. Um, but then also, if you had a garden within a larger ecosystem that was surrounded by more green space, you would actually have even more lady beetles because they have a healthier environment around your house. So they have more places that they can be moving to and from. Also, it looks like we have a couple questions in the chat here. Um, so from Jody, is anyone collecting actual specimens? If so, what species? That is a really good question. Historically, yes, a lot of researchers like the Bruce L. Parker collection that we have, or that Fairbanks has in their, um, at their museum. Um, a lot of older naturalists and biologists would very actively collect insects. Um, in terms of currently, nobody at VCE is very actively collecting specimens. We'll sometimes take like one if it's one of the really small species that are difficult to um, identify without the actual specimen. 
but that like this is just my personal take on it i always feel bad killing anything even if they're tiny insects so i prefer to just take as many photos as possible and you know try to identify that way um i don't know of anyone who is currently actively collecting lady beetles though that said if that's something that you're interested in you know you you certainly are welcome to do it and hopefully would share your data with us um where in North America is the greatest biodiversity of lady beetles? That is another really good question. I don't have a mental state by state comparison as to where has the most lady beetles and where has fewer. Um, I think that Southern, I think in the South, there's a higher um, diversity of them in general though, because it's warmer. So they can, they're, it's just easier to support more species when you have a warmer climate for the whole year, but you can find lady beetles all the way up through Alaska. There definitely are fewer species up there, but there are some species that really need that cold winter and don't do as well if they're in warmer environments. I'm going to ask a question here, Julia. Of course. So why use the term lady beetle versus ladybug? And I've also heard lady bird. Yes. What, what do they mean? <laughs> um, so uh, lady beetle is just kind of like the, um, the overarching scientific term for them because they're beetles. Um, I think, I'm actually going to fact check myself really quick as I say this, but I'm pretty sure that lady bird was the, because lady beetles as a whole are found across like the whole world. So I'm pretty sure lady bird was the more European common name for them. And then in America, it became lady bug. So I think that's kind of been the evolution of the name. Um, but I will fact check myself on that. I can actually add a little bit to this, uh, Julia, if you don't mind. Perfect, go for it. Folks, this is Bobby Farley Trubia from the Fairbanks Museum. Um, I actually heard about this and there's a church in, in, in Britain that has a, an entire article about it, St. Joan Hershey, a Catholic church. Apparently, this is what I remember hearing, there was a, a town in medieval times that was having an aphid infestation. They went to church and prayed for help and the lady beetles appear, appeared. So they named them after Our Lady, like the Virgin Mary. And that is where the name in English comes from, Lady Beetles being Our Lady. And so they, they thought it was an answer to their prayers when these beetles showed up and ate all the aphids. And uh, I think I found the article from the church, uh, if you wanna find out <laughs> some more, let's see. Anyway, it's, uh, that's what I've heard. Uh, you can look it up yourselves. It is religious uh, to how their divine intervention saved crops. <laughs> I'll end with that. Yep, that actually, thank you, Bobby. That's actually exactly what came up when I just Googled to fact check myself. And it was, it says in the United States, the name was adapted to Ladybug. So that's how we, that's how we ended up with that in the US. Also, if anyone has any further questions or wants me to elaborate on anything more, like definitely feel free to unmute yourself, say hi, and ask whatever questions you have. Yep, other people on Zoom can feel free to, to chime in whenever they want to. Um, and otherwise, I think you know we can take a, another question or two if there are any. Also, I just want to note that, um, again, anyone is super free to email me at any time. And there are a ton of resources on iNaturalist that both I have created, the previous AmeriCorps member in my position created, and that iNaturalist has for like how you can use iNaturalist and kind of assistance with that. Um, it is very user friendly. Um, so that that's another um, resource that we have. And then on that Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas link that I popped in the chat, 
you have a species profile page that has links to profiles for each species that has been recorded in Vermont with photos and interactive map identification information along with like the habitats they use, um, the food that they eat, et cetera. Um, some of them don't have much information just because there hasn't been a lot of research done on lady beetles, like many beetles and insects at large. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we'll wrap up here unless anyone has any last thoughts. And um, I'm sure you can feel free to reach out to Julia. She put her email in the Zoom chat and I, I copied that over to Facebook as well. So you can get in, in touch with her. And um, I know I'm excited to go out and try to find some lady beetles this year. I've used the Seek app a little bit and it's really user-friendly and really great to just like uh, point your camera at something and be able to identify it. So it's a great way to get started. Um, so thank you so much for doing this program with us. And we're excited to. Um, learn more about lady beetles this summer and get outside. And I hope I hope everyone else is, is um, excited too to participate in, in some citizen science to learn more about Vermont's lady beetle populations. So thank you, Julia. And we'll yeah. sign off here. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot them at, uh, at Julia. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.